Hello everyone and welcome back to the afternoon sessions on this second day of the Translating Europe Forum. I hope you made the most of the break, also finding a bit of time to boost your energy levels uh, for the sessions to come this afternoon. You may have even found time to for some one-to-one -one networking. I managed to fit in a quick meeting there. Uh, and there will be more opportunities for networking at the end of the day. Uh, we've had 700 meeting requests uh, sent and only 186 accepted. So do uh, check your meeting requests uh, and accept, decline or reschedule. But before we think about networking later on, we have many, many interesting topics to explore, the first of which will now be looking at how industry and academia will collaborate, something that actually came up in the What's the Buzz session yesterday. This session will be moderated by Viveta Jean, who is a translation and localization industry specialist at Intertranslations, and she's a member of the Globalization and Localization Association, or GALA. Welcome, Viveta. You're muted. Please unmute your microphone. Thank you very much, Amida. <laughs> I appreciate it. OK, uh, well, I'm now going to leave the proceedings with you. The only thing just to remind everybody to send in your questions and answers through the questions and polls tab, which is on the right hand side of your session screen. So enjoy the session. Viveta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So let me share now uh, my slides. Okay, perfect. So welcome everybody to this uh, panel uh, on collaboration on training, industry and academia. A uh, short introduction. So I'm Viveta Jean, Translation and Localization Industry Specialist with Intertranslations, as Amita just said. Intertranslations is an ISO certified company with offices in Greece, UK and France and business units in Turkey and China. We're an LSP providing translation, localization and post-editing services at an international level, covering all EU and Asian languages with main fields being life sciences, medical devices, software, e-commerce, automotive and gaming, just to mention some. Uh, machine translation engine creation and training and machine translation post-editing are one of our fields of expertise. And this is also my field of PhD research, which is all about how to minimize the cognitive effort of post-editors, increasing their productivity and improving the quality of uh, the empty output. Now, as a representative of uh, the gala, Machine Translation Post-Editing uh, Training Special Interest Group. I'm going to present you our work uh, towards a common machine translation post-editing uh, training protocol, uh, bringing together academia, LSPs, post-editors and clients. This is an ambitious initiative. Well, in September 2020, Gala Association, Lucia, Lucia Guerrero, MT specialist at CPSL and I, uh, we founded the MTP Training Special Interest Group. And uh, the MTP Training Special Interest Group is a, a collaborative initiative to develop best practices in the training and preparation of professionals handling the post-editing of machine translated content. So what is the goal of this uh, group? The goal is to share experience uh, in the field of training post-editors, common practices and standards. Uh, then to identify the training needs of post-editors based on the experience from all parties, academia, LSPs, post-editors and clients. And finally, develop a common post-editing training protocol. This is a handbook for all the parties involved, which will be shared with all GALA members. The four chapters of the book are already there in our platform for the GALA members in Basecamp. So what is original, let's say, in this group? It is that it is organized in the form of uh, a common intelligence workshop, meaning that our work depends on uh, the attendance, the ideas, the experience and networking of uh, the members, as well as our efforts to evaluate the input. So the power and the potential lies on each member of the group um, and not the moderators. And uh, this is the reason that we uh, decided to split uh, the group in four subgroups to serve the purpose of these calls. So we have the academia group and uh, the representative 
uh, are the representatives are Pete Smith and Sabrina Girletti uh, from the academia. The clients group uh, with Christina Anselmi as a representative. The LSPs group with Diego Creseri and the post editors group with Jessica Jakub. So what is really interesting is that we have more or less uh, the same percentage of participants. Uh, it is 30% LSPs, 30% academia and 10% uh, uh, post editors, 30% clients. We now count like um, 80 members. So in each call we have from, from 20 to 80 uh, participants and uh, the total number is I think 177. So we have a platform for our discussion to share our ideas, the minutes of uh, the special interest group, the reference documents, and this is where we will um, also uh, publish our work, uh, the final common post editing uh, training protocol handbook. So I would like to, um, to invite you to join this group. I will show later on the slide with uh, the relevant link for the registration. Now I would like to share with you some interesting findings as um, I'm representative of uh, the work being done in the machine translation post editing training. Uh, first of all, we discussed about the profiles of the post editors and what differentiates a translator uh, from a reviewer and the post editor. Uh, we reached the conclusion that the post editor is not a reviewer because there are different skills involved and uh, we have um, uh, we have drafted uh, the profiles of, uh, of the junior and the expert uh, post editor. Uh, it seems that we need a translation experience of one to three years for machine translation uh, post editing. Uh, it is uh, like an evolution of the translation service. And then regarding the file types, because this is a question um, that is very common, not all, um, no, excuse me, not all the domains are relevant for uh, post editing. Uh, so creative content and marketing content is not relevant for machine translation post editing. This is what all groups agreed with. And um, training in CAT tools and neural machine translation is very important as it increases the productivity and it delivers better quality of machine translation post editing. So both light and full post editing are applicable with neural machine translation. And uh, this um, differentiation of light and full serves probably more the commercial perspective of uh, the machine translation post editing. Now, the most uh, important part, which is linked to, to our panel discussion today, are the main uh, machine translation post editing uh, training gaps that we identified. And uh, some of them you will see later, they may be common in general with uh, the gaps in the translation training. So what we lack here are the trainers uh, because this is a new service and uh, here we need more uh, dedicated and university courses. Uh, we need practice. Uh, we need, of course, to understand the machine translation problems. The, the training is needed in this uh, field and understanding the machine translation post editing quality level um, because actually it is not clear what is machine translation post editing and um, of course we need to advance the technical skills because there are many linguists not being familiarized with um, technology or with CAD tools and uh, anything uh, technological and then uh, we need translation and revision experience, knowledge of machine translation. Uh, as we said, we lack the experience in CAD tools and we don't have access to CAD tools. Of course, not um, in all countries we have the same level of experience in CAD tools and uh, it is not even accepted in some countries machine translation post editing as a service. And we need more cooperation between academia and uh, LSPs, language service providers. We need more workshops, uh, more internships, more programs, and um, webinars, video tutorials, real exercises, practice, practice, and practice, because uh, familiarization with uh, machine translation post editing and the errors of machine translation is what makes the improvement. 
uh, maybe a good motivation would be the remuneration for training because um, this is something new and it is very it needs a lot of expertise so sometimes translators are motivated to be remunerated for that and we need to find a way to calculate the decision making speed and the change in speed and this is also related to uh, the compensation of uh, linguists and making uh, the compensation models more transparent. And of course, uh, we still have gray areas in the quality standards. So this is uh, what I would like to share with you uh, as the findings of uh, the GALA MTP training SIG. And these are, all, are already included in our uh, uh, handbook. So here you may find the link and you can join us share your perspectives, your ideas, and contribute to the um, progress of uh, our industry and uh, to, to finally embrace these new technologies and not be afraid of, uh, of them. Okay, so now I'm going to proceed with, uh, with our discussion panel and uh, allow me to introduce you our panelists uh, for our discussion on collaboration on training between industry and academia. So we have with us Adriano Ferraresi. Uh, Adriano is Associate Professor in English Language and Translation at the University of Bologna and Coordinator of uh, the MA in Specialized Translation of the same university. Gary Massey is Professor of Translation Studies, Director of the Institute of Translation and Interpreting and Deputy Dean of the School of Applied Linguists at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. Enrico Antonio Mion, is a freelance Italian translator, a machine translation post editing trainer and owner of Optimas, a company that offers product listing optimization services for online sellers. And uh, Emilia Perez is associate professor and head of the Department of Translation Studies at Constantine the Philosopher University in Nitra, Slovakia. So welcome all. Thank you very much for your excellent cooperation and participation in this uh, panel. And uh, just for a warm up, I'm going to present now the topics. So we uh, decided to discuss today on the competencies and profiles in the workplace, because uh, these are really important and uh, they evolve all the time. The new translation industry roles and the training gaps, the training of students, which is really interesting, the training of the professional translators and becoming a trainer, because if we don't have trainers, we have no future. Okay, so now we start with um, interacting with our audience and we open the poll number one about the competencies and profiles in the workplace. So can we open, open the poll number one, please? Because it is not visible to me. Okay, so I read the question. In your opinion, which skills uh, beyond translation skills are most necessary in today's translation market? communication and interpersonal skills, organizational and project management skills, analytical and research skills, technical and technological problem solving skills, including independence and quick learning. We allow some time for our audience Okay, I think that we can close the poll, but just to let the technical moderator know that I have no uh, access to the second device with Slido, so the results are not visible to me.
Okay, now um, I'm going to ask um, my panelists, um, do you have any access to Slido from a second device? I do. Okay, could you please share the results, just read? Yes, so the, the skills that are um, most in demand are uh, with 54% of the answers, like technical and technological skills, followed by problem solving skills, and then communication and interpersonal skills, organizational and project management skills, and finally, analytical and research skills. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Adriano. No problem. Okay, so thank you very much for your answers. And uh, I think we, it's time for us to, to start the discussion and uh, see um, if the profiles of translators are changing and if so, how do they change? And um, this is um, to start with uh, Enrico. And of course, to see, uh, do graduate profiles match the job profiles of the workplace? So Enrico, would you like to share with us your perspective? Yes, thank you, Vivita. Well, it's very nice, first of all, to read that the first, the number one answer was technical and technological skills, because I meant to talk about that in the sense that by answering the question, are the profiles of translators changing? I don't think the profile itself of a translator changed over the decades or even centuries in the sense that a translator still has to master the target and the source language. What is changing actually is the, the technology that we use. We move from paper to, to computers and now we talk about uh, machine translation, we, could, we talk about localization and software, etc. So the core profile, in my opinion, is that of mastering a, the source and the target language. And what a translator has to do is to keep up with the pace of uh, the changing environment. And also, uh, beside the technology that's always there to, to, to help the translator uh, do uh, its translation task, it's also very important to keep in mind that in, in the next years and even right now, if, even if we have machine translation and many other softwares, uh, it's very important to, uh, for the industry to have specialized and actually have expert translators. That means persons, people that really know and master the source and the target language. Once we have the base, we can work on upskilling all other aspects of the, of the work of a translator and uh, we can continue learning and keep up with the technology that we keep on uh, on changing and evolving in the in, in the next year. So to sum up, for me, the, the profile is not changing. It, what's changing is the sur surrounding and the tools that we use. Okay, thank you very much. So you see that there is the same base, as we said. The translation uh, skills are the same and this do not change, but we need to go deeper and uh, allow technology to um, to be in there and uh, of course exactly. uh, have some progress. Okay, and uh, now we'd like to invite Emilia to, to share with us uh, her perspective regarding the profiles. Thank you, thank you Viveta and hello everyone. Uh, well, for me, yes, translation is a dynamic industry. Of course, we can see manifold changes emerging in several areas, but, but I also think that uh, has always been the case, as Enrico mentioned. Um, these changes might seem a bit more rapid, but uh, this is because the technologies we use evolve quickly. Uh, I absolutely agree as well that using new, more developed technologies might not necessarily mean emergence of new profiles, but of course we need to point out uh, the need to keep pace with them. Also in academia, when training our students to be able to assess the tools and use the tools which suit the job and the assignment. And I think this is very important. Um, for me personally, having background in audiovisual translation, the profession has changed enormously, bringing new requirements for skills 
which are adapting not only to the technology, however, but also the development in the profession as, as such and the development in film industry as such. And here I absolutely agree with something that Enrico also implied that we need to look also maybe in going into details with the competencies we normally focus on, but also we might need to look beyond translation if we want to prepare our graduates to be real professionals. And this for me would mean also not excluding the training for service profession or business administration. For example, the European Masters in Translation Network uh, under the DGT explicitly uh, describes this area uh, as important for implementation of translation from uh, negotiation with clients, project management, budgeting, marketing. And I know that for maybe some of the programs, this might seem as something beyond the translation training, but I think this is very important for our graduates as well. And for me personally, this is one of the reasons why cooperation between academia, industry and profession is needed and will be needed because only in this way we can make sure that the graduates actually will meet the profiles which are requested. Thank you, thank you very much, Emilia. So they, this means that we all need to to put some effort, even uh, from the academia perspective. We need to work harder and work into detail in order to uh, to communicate to students that they need to work harder because the expectations of the industry are higher. And uh, then, of course, embrace the technology because this is something different. It is the cognitive and it is the technical and these needs need to be married somehow. So thank you very much both for your input. And uh, now we go to the poll number two. Could we please open the poll number two? And I'm going to read what is the question here. Uh, below is a list of tasks that language experts carry out in companies communicating with teams, clients and or vendors, managing projects, evaluating processes, writing reports, working with data like annotating, analyzing, collecting, transcribing, working with software and technological tools, developing, analyzing or testing. So for which ones do you feel least prepared? So I suppose the poll is open and uh, you can give us your input. So this is a very good question for us for discussion because it will reveal where is uh, the focus and uh, where we need more work. I give you some time, some more seconds. So if we're ready, we can close the poll and see the results. And of course, I will ask the help of Adriano. <laughs> So I'm, I'm the official poll results reader, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. So I, I just uh, mentioned the, the top two results, which are uh, working with data, uh, annotating, analyzing, etc., and working with software uh, and technological tools. Okay, thank you very much. So it is obvious that um, it is not only referring to to people uh, like linguists, but we need to, to have uh, in, the, in the industry, we need to, to provide the industry with uh, managers, meaning people that have uh, an advanced level or expertise or experts that uh, have already um, been involved in uh, technology and uh, they work with data, they work with machine translation engines, and so on. So this is uh, really interesting. Okay, uh, so let's go and see with our panelists and uh, with Adriano specifically, what are the new translation industry roles that we see today? And what are the training gaps? Yes. 
Um, so um, we heard quite a lot on the um, new translation industry roles this morning. So I hope I'll offer some interesting uh, new, uh, partially new insights. And the data and experience I'm sharing with you um, this afternoon is um, comes from a, a new funded Erasmus Plus project called uh, AppSkills, in which we, as part of the project, what we tried to do was to carry out a systematic search for uh, job positions targeting graduates, not only in translation, but also in languages and um, linguistics. Now, the good news is that a large share of the, of the jobs we found are still uh, jobs for uh, translation or localization professionals, which are sometimes called uh, linguists, which was somewhat surprising um, to us. But um, however, the kind of jobs we were specifically interested in uh, in this project were the jobs that lie, so to speak, at the margins uh, of the translation industry or better at the crossroads between the translation industry and the language uh, and technology industry at large. Now, um, we found a surprising variety of positions for which the competencies that uh, translators already have uh, make a, a good, very, very good match, even if the positions themselves are not targeting um, translators. Now, given the little time, I'll just briefly summarize the, the results of this survey, uh, and I'll mention two macro categories of positions. Um, the that emerged from this survey, of course. Um, the first one, one of the most uh, highly in demand um, positions is that of the project manager. Now, so the person who oversees translation uh, processes uh, or in general uh, projects, um, who keeps contact with clients, with vendors, but also, and this was uh, somewhat the surprising part to us, that is able to uh, analyze or critically evaluate performance data and communicate uh, these results. So write reports on them or report on the, on the performance data of um, their team. The second group of positions um, is that of technology and data specialists. Um, and here you shouldn't think of engineers or uh, computational linguists. Uh, these positions are the position, are positions for uh, people who have been users of uh, technologies, say cat tools, but are also um, tech savvy enough to uh, combine these technologies in creative ways uh, or unexpected ways, or even tweak somewhat the, the technologies. Now, these are the people who prepare, for example, the language resources for machine translation uh, systems, who maintain translation memories or terminological databases, or, uh, and this was a, a position that was even mentioned this morning, um, technology consultants. Now, coming to the second part of the question, so the, the training gaps. Um, to access these roles, in our view, uh, translator education certainly would benefit from the introduction of uh, advanced technology courses, even programming courses, if you want. But what the employers really insisting insisted on um, having us teach our students is uh, or uh, developing uh, in our students is first of all analytical and problem solving skills which allows them to um, solve well to face problems and solve them in potentially unexpected ways but also communication skills so the ability to communicate the results of one's job in a clear, effective way to teams, to clients, to companies. And now, um, the so the, the take-home the take message, uh, these are not really positions that are uh, targeting translators specifically, but if we uh, translators are ready to get out of our comfort zone, in a sense, there are really a variety of positions that are uh, open to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adriano. And um, well, about uh, you mentioned that the training gap uh, refers to the solving skills and decision making skills, probably, which arise because of the uh, technological um, progress and, of course, of the machine translation post editing, which entails more skills. So, this means that um, the academia, meaning the universities, should 
find a way, should find some practice uh, to trigger these skills because so far decision-making skills, okay, they exist in the translation process, but they have a different nature. Uh, we have dilemmas, we call them translation dilemmas, but we have never been asked to, to say, uh, should I delete this, should I add this, things like that, which need a very fast tackling, let's say, of the situation. So this is one thing to, to think about and how to handle with practice and or other exercises. I don't know, maybe we need more research for that. And the second thing, I would like your opinion for the following, because we talk about managers and translation managers, translation project managers, or uh, machine translation specialists. So do you think that these uh, job positions would require as a basis um, a translation degree? Yes, so I'll quickly react to both um, questions. So um, concerning the first question, the, the approach that we are adopting here at the University of Bologna is that of introducing more research into the careers of students. So getting them used to carry out original research, which of course, and research is all about uh, thinking about uh, interesting questions, uh, which might be academic, but might also be practice-based, and then trying to find out methods to solve them. So through research, uh, we think that students might acquire the kind of problem-solving um, mindset that will then be uh, useful later on. And um, concerning the second question, so whether we need uh, or whether translators are the people who manage, uh, who are uh, fit for uh, project management roles, we have, uh, uh, in fact, an answer from a large um, language service provider who told us that most of their uh, project managers are translators who enter the profession as translators and then acquire experience with the company processes and are then the, be the best people to then manage uh, other uh, people actually carrying out the translation. So in a way, a more senior position uh, that of coordinating processes that they already have hands-on experience with. Okay, thank you very much. It was really useful. And uh, talking about the training gaps, now we can go and talk about the training of students, which is a really hot topic. So probably I need to, to share my screen again. Uh, okay, and here we need to open the poll number three. And uh, the question now is, what should translators of the future be trained to do? Uh, multiple answers are allowed. Uh, the possible answers are content creation, transcreation, accessible communication, localization, domain specific translation, post editing, revision, quality assurance management, project management, language data analysis, creation, language technology consulting, and language technology development. So this is the question for us to understand what we should offer as a training in the future. What is the trend? And um, I think that we can close this poll. And uh, Adriana, are we ready to share? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So what are, let's say, the five more uh, popular answers? Okay. First one is post-editing. Uh, yes, there you go. You see them on the screen now. Okay, perfect. First is post-editing. Thank you very much. Then we have quality assurance management, project management, uh, revision, then localization, language technology consulting, language technology development, and probably we don't have transcreation. Um, so this shows that the focus is on post-editing right now and uh, the, the neural machine translation and all this progress. Then the second thing after, because post-editing is uh, linked to, um, it's linked to time and uh, cost, then we have the quality because we all want 
uh, the quality aligned with uh, the time and cost. And of course, we need someone to uh, manage quality time and cost, which is all the priorities here. And of course, revision, which is uh, correlated to quality and uh, localization, of course. Okay, so we're in, in need of management, let's say, and um, uh, upskilled and reskilled translators. Okay, thank you very much for sharing uh, the results. And uh, now I can go back to the presentation. And uh, we start with our discussion on the training of students and our panelists will share their experience. What training is provided by academia to cover any training gaps arising from upskilling and reskilling translators? So we start with uh, Adriano Ferraresi. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Viveta. So, um... Starting from um, this year, uh, maybe you can move on with the slides. Yes, sure. Thank you very much Please. for Thank the you. reminder. Yeah. Um, so starting from this year at the University of Bologna, we introduced a rather uh, substantial change in our Masters in Specialized Translation, um, where we have uh, two curricula. So the let's call it more um, traditional uh, specialized translation curriculum and notice that students uh, have to enroll in one or the other even though there are uh, intersections between them. Um, in the specialized translation curriculum the focus is really on translation skills uh, including uh, of course um, localization skills, post-editing skills, uh, but also the more uh, cultural, uh, the transmission of the more um, cultural, intercultural competencies. Um, the novelty is in fact the translation and technology uh, curriculum, where the focus, um, well, where students in fact still acquire uh, specialized translation skills, but the focus is more on the technological, um, the technological component. So um, developing, well, um, becoming advanced users of uh, translation technologies, including, for example, um, methods to adapt uh, machine translation systems or evaluate uh, their output, not post-editing, but evaluating the output of machine translation systems. Um, but also other, let's say, more technologically advanced methods like uh, machine learning methods that they acquire in the um, natural language processing course. On the other hand, we have uh, these um, research-based courses I was talking about before, like the language data analysis course, where the idea is really that of stimulating uh, students to um, becoming uh, problem solvers, critical thinkers, becoming used to analyzing uh, data and drawing conclusions on them. Now, where the, all these competencies um, come together in a sense, is this uh, new module called professional practice and applied research, which is also perhaps the most central uh, one in given the topic of this panel on collaboration between industry and academia. And the idea there is that students carry out uh, a rather um, substantial traineeship, 250 hours, in a, in a company which might or might not be a language service provider. Um, the other co um, companies we're talking to include also, for example, um, companies uh, creating systems for semantic annotation, or uh, just to give an example, uh, a platform for um, to develop uh, chatbots uh, allowing hotels to talk to their um, customers. Um, in addition to this uh, traineeship, uh, students are required to carry out a joint research project supervised on the one hand by a company tutor and on the other hand by an academic tutor. And the idea there is that of producing a paper or a presentation that really details the research that they carried out within academia, which we think is also a very good way of having students benefit from, um, from a traineeship and develop skills in a sort of protected environment, which is not yet that of the of the profession. Thank you very much, Adriano, for sharing all this information. And uh, now I will ask uh, Gary Massi to yes. to present us. 
Yes, I'm very happy to. Thank you for uh, for allowing me this uh, this platform. Thank you very much indeed. I think um, Adriano's course is very very interesting. The idea that you've got the ability to to set a certain priority area as a student, moving either in the technological direction or another direction. We were thinking of the same. We have uh, since 19, uh, 2019, just before the COVID crisis, established three basic profiles within our program. Um, the core profile remains specialized translation. It's the black areas here in the, in the, on the slide. Language technology, pre-editing, machine translation, post-editing. Um, these, these are key and core and everybody learns them. Domain knowledge is something that I think is still very, very much required in certain areas. In Switzerland, of course, we have the pharmaceuticals, for instance, uh, who are a big, uh, a big client of our, our graduates' work. And, of course, professional competence with an internship. These are the focal points. Now, if you're a student with us, you can choose just to do that, plus a little bit of translation management. Now, I've noticed that the key word, translation management, coming up again and again, not just project management, but process management as well. We add on aspects that we've identified, particularly in the Swiss market through research we've done with larger Swiss companies, that they are interested in having a consultancy perspective from the experts in translation. So translation professionals are becoming consultancy professionals, helping companies, telling them how to use their technologies how to use the perhaps free services that are available and when not to use them. We've also noticed a very, very strong interface now that's developing between organizational communication and multilingualism. Of course, Switzerland is a multilingual country. And for that reason, of course, all companies will have this multilingual edge. But now when they, they've realized that corporate communication and organizational communication cannot be just a top-down affair. They have realized that they've got lots of potential with either their freelance staff or their in-house in staff who are working as translators. And it's there that we're seeing an increasing interface between organizational communication and translation. And indeed, we are trying to educate our translators for that particular profession as well. The third area, that, that, that people can specialize in whilst retaining, as I said, the core skills is barrier-free communication and audiovisual translation, which again, in the Swiss market is very strong. And uh, at that point, I think I'll hand over now to the next speaker because I think that's where she will be putting her, 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 her main emphatic point in presenting her program. Thank you very much, Gary. So, Emilia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, just to briefly introduce uh, the programs at Constantine, the Philosopher University in Mitra. Uh, well, we provide a combined translation and interpreting bachelor and MA programs. And this might be something rather specific for our region, where combining the translation and interpreting career part uh, in practice remains very common. And our program actually uh, has quite a long tradition uh, dating back to 1917 and 1980s and in past being one of the research hubs for theory of artistic communication and translation in the country. We actually originally used to specialize on literary translation. However, we absolutely understand the, the needs of the profession and industry today. And for last uh, decades, we present uh, uh, and we focus on variety of modules students can select based on their projected specialization. And we also, as the colleagues mentioned, focus on the area of specialized translation and interpreting. Uh, we work with language technologies, machine translation and post editing, but uh, there is quite a strong demand for services and, and uh, quite fine-tuned skills in audiovisual translation and media accessibility in the country, where uh, in our programs, besides language-specific dubbing, translation and subtitling courses, uh, as well as courses aimed at uh, subtitling for deaf and hard of hearing and audio, audio description, we are presently broadening the design of our MA study program for a variety of new courses uh, aimed at uh, barrier-free communication and inclusion. And here we attempt to focus not only on artistic and cultural sector, but also public sector, since there is quite demand for services 
uh, I believe not only in our region. Uh, here we are very closely cooperating with uh, the target communities and also with the profession. Uh, but important to mention is that uh, we had opportunity to start cooperation with uh, the authorities as well, which is very important for us and for shaping also the design of the program. Uh, we are also dedicating attention to the service provision training uh, in relation to all our specialization, uh, not only audiovisual translation and media accessibility training. And we focus on uh, creating links with national institutions and LSPs. Uh, of course, we invite experts and professionals, but what we have been trying to do for uh, last few years is to incorporate uh, the professionals and, and uh, the colleagues from industry directly to our training as our trainers. And this is, has been happening mainly uh, in the training for business uh, administration and project management, uh, as well as technologies. And it has been quite a successful project for the last four and five years. Uh, I'm mentioning this because I think this is one of the things that actually helps us in our efforts to keep track with the new developments uh, in the profession and in the industry. Uh, we also provide internships and uh, several um, uh, exchanges with a professional environment. At our department, our internships uh, are mandatory for all trainees at MA level and optional for trainees uh, on uh, BA level. Uh, but of course, uh, another structure uh, which is working very well is also uh, the in inviting of the professionals to our institutions, uh, because I think this common cooperation brings a lot, uh, not only to academia, but it brings a lot to both sides. So this would be shortly introducing uh, Nitra. Thank you very much all for introducing uh, and presenting your programs. Uh, it was really interesting and it is great to see that the trend is to bridge the gap and uh, make the cooperation uh, between um, industry and academia flourish. And uh, to show the magic word here was how to, to show uh, the linguists how to do things. And it's not only about the linguists, but this technology evolution brings um, this how to question for anyone involved in any uh, job position in an LSP or as a trainer in the academia. It is a uh, something for everyone. So with this how-to, we're going to uh, go to the training of uh, professional translators and open the poll number four. So here we decided to have a poll uh, asking um, if you agree with uh, the following uh, statement. So the question is, I don't do post-editing, therefore I don't need to attend a training on machine translation post-editing. Yes or no? Okay, it seems that no is what is dominant here. Okay, and I think that we can close this poll and the result shows that um, we are all thirsty for uh, technology and for training actually. Uh, so training is a big priority right now. Uh, even if we don't use the service, it is important to be uh, aware of uh, the evolution and what is existing and to try new things and see if they suit us because it's not everything for everybody. Uh, so now uh, talking about the training of professional translators, I think that um, we should start a discussion with um, uh, Enrico and I'm going to share again my presentation. So the question now is what is what training is provided by language service providers to cover training gaps arising from upskilling and reskilling uh, translators. 
So this part, uh, as a representative of an LSP, I can say, and as a representative of the GALA MTP training SIG, where Diego Creser is the representative of the LSPs, we notice that uh, it is very important that we have uh, webinars, we have uh, instructions, we have um, experts uh, being next to, to juniors and uh, internal trainers in the LSPs uh, to show the new skills and um, train uh, the junior linguists uh, when they are just graduates and becoming their, beginning their career. And um, we apply a um, series of webinars and um, we uh, have collaborations with uh, universities, internships, and um, anything actually that we can do in an LSP, uh, writing guidelines, um, using guidelines uh, like, uh, for example, for post editing TAUS guidelines, um, designed courses anything needed. So this is what we do in the industry, more or less. And I'm going to ask now Enrico to share with us as a trainer, what are the challenges? Yes, thank you, Viveta. As we can tell from the next slide, beside the challenge for the trainer to become the training, but we talk about that later. Uh, during my training sessions on machine translation post editing to professional translators, uh, I see participants that come in, comes in, and they they really know how to fully use the cut tool that they use or any other platform or software. And here I'm talking about shortcuts. I'm talking about using personal glossaries, personal uh, memory translation, etc. So I, I really see that since. Uh, machine translation post editing is related to the use of a cat tool. Most of the time, they don't take advantage of all the features of the cat tools. And also, uh, they have a full knowledge of the uh, language service industry structure. And I, we, all, we already talked about this in the sense that they don't know what's going on behind the scenes. They just receive the, uh, the, the, the post editing uh, task and they don't know what what question to ask? How uh, what kind of engine has been used, and what's the tr uh, the, tool, the the complete process actually behind uh, receiving the 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 post editing task? And also, and we talked about this uh, earlier, they have a poor knowledge of the basic selling skills like marketing and how to set prices and and so on which is very important for uh post editing because we have to keep in mind that we have to be efficient and so it's very hard for for trainer uh, for trainees to know how to position themselves in the market beside all the gaps that i've detect detected these are the three most important ones uh for me to fill these gaps or any other type of gaps uh, the most important thing is to is continuous learning. As we said, technology is changing very rapidly and it's very important to keep up with uh, learning new skills and learning new tools to use. And an example of, of the gaps and the, the training uh, that have been given uh, on machine translation post editing, uh, I, I can show you that by, by using just one technology that, that is machine translation, uh, there are three use cases. Uh, this is a link with the, the, the pool that, that, that we just completed. Um, and I would like to make sure that translators understand that, the, that machine translation is just a tool and that you have three options actually to use this tool. The first one is, of course, everyone, when they, every translator, freelance translator, most of the time when they think about post editing, they think about a, of a translation agency asking them to do post editing. That's just one option. You also have the option once you master the, the engine um, and your mar marketing skills, you have also the option to offer post editing services to direct clients. And there's also the third option, which is to integrate the engine in the uh, working environment of the professional translator and use it as another tool 
like a glossary, like a translation memory, like a spell checker, etc., to, to speed up the translation process. So this is what I call augmented translation in the, in the sense that uh, the, the translator is aided, is helped by so many tools that it, they can integrate in the, in the working environment and the, the, a machine engine fits perfectly among a translation memory and a glossary, for example. So the training that I've been giving, um, it's in French only, and on my website, uh, I have a blog as well. And I think there are very uh, important information there for speak, for the people that speak, that speak French uh, here today. And, and these, these are the, the main gaps and how to fill them and my experience with machine translation post-editing as a trainer. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Enrico, for thank sharing you. your perspective. Um, so, um, a very important factor is uh, also the, the psychological factor when it comes to training and uh, new technologies, because uh, there was a lot of discussion in the past and uh, from your answers today, uh, during the polls, it seems that this uh, uh, is not anymore a barrier, uh, that technology was like a monster coming to steal our jobs, etc. So it seems that now technology becomes more friendly and we all believe that this is uh, something to contribute to, to our development and uh, not something that is going to, to be, uh, okay, let's say disadvantages for us. Okay, so now what we miss and what we need to cover is the part of the trainers because to, gap, to cover the gaps we need trainers. And uh, Gary Massey is going to talk to us about how to become a trainer and what happens uh, when we become trainers. And I'm going to share again the presentation. Okay, so the question is which translation services are in most need of trainers and how can we help trainers keep up with the evolution of the translation profession? So we have here some ideas, workshops with LSPs and professionals, internships, Chips, mentor tandem, job shadowing, mentored freelance work, or joint research projects. And Gary, the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it's a, it's 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 like a Swiss Army knife, isn't it? Uh, we're asking um, our teachers to do the same as our students and to do it even better. And what applies to the students, what Enrico has just talked about, applying to the students applies equally, if not more, to the trainers. And I think rather than answer the question directly, I think I'll pick, point out a few of the problems that we've got, because actually where we need trainers is everywhere in the translation professions. Uh, there is not more or less, but what we can do is we can find out in our local environments, perhaps Switzerland in our case, or Europe, Asia, where the main deficits are. Now, to do that, I um, conducted within the our, our, our university as a member of VMT. It's also a member of SUT, which is a worldwide organization of translator, translator and interpreter uh, training universities. And uh, in 2018, we conducted a survey of continuing professional development needs for trainers. Now, the very fact that our return rate was only 45%, indicates a slightly low priority here. And we also know from very, very many sources, if you do it, I've done a bit of research in this area, there's virtually no research on how to train translation teachers. There are very few models and there are very few initiatives, either international or national. Um, what normally happens is that the university have a kind of generic courses on, you know, training people how to teach, but not on the specifics of a particular didactic um, or a, a specialized didactics. There are limited structures and incentives as well. We found out worldwide that there are very, very few hours put aside for teachers to develop their professional skills for continuing professional development. And these, when they do have them, are largely optional. There's no real pressure. Um, and going back to what Enrico said and picking up on what we've said throughout, there is a distinct practice theory divide because when needs were talked about, there's clear need for more professional translation and more professional translation technology, CPD training, continuing professional development training. Uh, 
The didactic needs are specifically the didactics of translation specific teaching and how to use educational technologies. This was before COVID. I think we're all up to speed now after COVID on educational technologies and the need to deliver everything online. Can I have the next slide, please? Sure, thank you. Now, there is a, a, a translator training profile that exists, but it's, I think, symptomatic that we don't even, many of us don't even know it exists. There's an EMT translator training profile that came out of an Optimal project, a project called Optimal in the last round of the EMT, the European Masters in Translation. And there we've got a number of competencies that teachers have to fulfill. And the one that's relevant to us is the orange segment, really, on the top left-hand side, field competence, the ability to actually know about the profession and get our students up to speed on the profession by having experience of the profession and the professional needs and the language service industry and its processes and products. Having that knowledge is absolutely vital to getting our students up to speed for current and future markets. So where do we go? What can we do? Our problems, as we've seen from the, the, the survey and as my own experience shows, is that we often either have practitioners or we have theorists. We have the research on the one hand and we have the practice on the other and never the twains tend to meet. I think it's up to every institution individually to find out what needs it has and to develop its own models. And if I can just give you an example of the way we're trying to tackle the problem, you might, uh, this, this might provide food for thought for you anyway. Can you go to the next slide, please, Viveta? Yes, sure. So what we've done is we've tried to address the local needs within Switzerland for our trainers. What do they need to know? Well, they need to have their specialist knowledge. We already recruit them for that. But they need to be able to teach, that's clear. They need to be able to do research and to apply that research. They also need to know about our institution because otherwise they're not gonna really survive in it. But above all, they need professional field knowledge and practice. So what do we do? Well, we've got a target setting system, a system whereby every year, Every teacher sits together with his or her boss, line manager, and works out a profile. They work out a profile. Where are my strengths? Where are my weaknesses? What do I have to do to fulfill this profile? So those who are very research heavy will have to do more translation. And they'll have to learn how to translate. Those who are more practice heavy will have to learn how to do research. And we've got a number of measures that we've developed for this. On the left hand, on the right hand side of this slide, what you see are just three levels of our very elaborated catalog and, and development system, our cost competence system. But basically these stretch from the lower level, just observing and assisting in courses to learn how to teach, to job shadowing of professionals out there in the market, to doing actual translation tasks under the supervision of translation experts. We also ask our, our teachers to actually team teach, to assist in student translation projects if they don't have any idea of the way the translation market works, or to actually do research if they need, if they need more research on the research side. But I think the, the most important thing is that we have an instrument whereby we can say to our teachers, look, people, if you want to teach translation here, you need to know about the industry. And we will actually give you hours and money to go out there and learn about the industry, to do mentored professional translation work. And we do have contacts with local uh, service providers and uh, with local agencies. Our own alumni association, for instance, has its own translation, in, uh, translation agency where we can provide teachers with mentors so that they can get translation experience of the way it really is to work on the market. That's the way we do it. And I think every institution needs to have this organizational development perspective. Otherwise, we're not gonna get anywhere. That's my particular view. But I think Amelia perhaps has also something to add. Thank you very much, Gary. It was inspiring. Amelia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gary. And I absolutely agree with uh, Viveta. Uh because I think this is a model we could all benefit from at our institutions. And, and exactly when we talk about trainers, uh, 
I believe one of the top challenges for our programs will always be how to help the trainers to keep up with new developments or how to provide a training reflecting the current needs of the profession. And to do that in the long run is quite a challenge and, and that goes not only for the trainers who are joining academia, but mainly also for the trainers who are already operating in academia. And I can only agree with Gary and, and the solution he implied, because I believe the solution lies in cooperation. And it lies in cooperation mainly with the profession uh, and with the industry, uh, but also within our home universities and with the universities in our countries and also the universities abroad. Uh, from my experience, uh, from few projects I have been cooperating on with several universities, uh, either via trained trainer schemes or some joint uh, initiatives in how to train, how to assess, how to proceed, how to teach particular tool. I must say this is something I, I, I see as very, very important and very valid and I think for obvious aspects, but another one uh, which we have not mentioned yet, and I would just like to point it out maybe as a point for future debate, is that uh, like this we can share expertise and good practice in translation training across Europe, respecting the characteristics not only of the national but also international requirements and, and also to grasp, prepare for and deal with developments in the industry and profession from broader than a local domestic perspective, uh, which is also as an aspect which requires attention because we know that in several areas we don't really always work only for our local markets and local clients. So maybe this is just one thing I would like to add to amazing Gary uh, talk uh, because I really find it very inspiring and uh, uh, I, I'm already taking a few tips from, uh, from his talk uh, for, for our, our programs and for our department. Thank you for that. Thank you very much, Emilia. And at this point, I would like to thank you all, uh, Adriano, Gary, Emilia, Antonio, everybody, Enrico, excuse me, uh, for being here, for presenting uh, this uh, panel, uh, discussing and showing how we can bridge the gaps and uh, all be a team and uh, work towards the evolution of the translation industry. So now um, we have a lot of uh, questions i think and uh, we have like um three minutes for that okay so let's start with uh, the most voted questions training students to be uh, post editors of machine translation and implying this is future that awaits has been described as creating the coffee bean pickers of the future your comments Yeah, um, I, I I know Chris and I respect her deeply and I, I, I to a certain extent agree with that. And this is why we are trying to push our students into higher value positions like consultancy. Not just post editing, but, um, you know, you've got to know how to do it because that's part of what you do. You know, everybody's doing that, you know, whether professionally or non-professionally. That, that needs to be there. But the ability to actually tell companies, institutions, requesters how to use these, these machine tra translation, uh, this machine translation technology in the best way, that's very important, I think. So, yes, I do. I, 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 I know and respect Chris. Don't always agree fully with her, but in this case, I think the idea is we, we, we push our students further. Thank you very much. So, can we see the next question? Um, we read and hear that machine translation post editing is booming, yet according to successive CSA research reports, MTP equals to approximately 4% of total industry turnover. Do many graduates move into machine translation post editing? Actually, I don't know if this is known. Can I... Uh add something on this. Uh, maybe it also depends on how we define the task of machine translation post-editing in the sense that uh, machine translation post-editing, like um, Enrico was saying before, is also there when we are using a cut tool. Okay, So it's not as if we are 
we are post editing only when we are uh, getting the the output of a machine translation system as such and then post editing the result we are using machine translation uh, we are post editing text in many different tools and we can think of that as the basis uh, so the machine translation output as the basis on uh, on which we elaborate on and that we uh, then um, turn into a finished uh, product so Again, it, it really depends on what we define as machine translation post-editing. Okay, yesterday we had a, a training a session in machine translation post-editing and uh, we had like 360 participants. So um, out of them, 8% had no experience with CAD tools and they were linguists mainly. So this shows that uh, in order to move into machine translation post-editing, probably uh, we have already been familiarized with CAD tools and we are ready to do it. I think that the most important factor here is the psychological factor for the linguists and then the training that they need. And um, I don't know if many graduates move into MTP, but there is still a barrier and uh, I hope that we soon will overcome it and many graduates will move into MTP because for us, this is the evolution of the profession. Okay, next question. Uh, I think we have time for one more and very uh, quickly. Can you name any other skills besides uh, technological machine translation post editing that has boosted within the last three, five years? Which one will boost next three to five years? Well, just a short comment from, from what I've observed, and, and I think it was also mentioned here and also in other debates during uh, Translation Europe Forum, is that we can uh, really see not only com competences as such, but like all of the groups of uh, personal and interpersonal skills, which are being requested in relation to uh, being a professional in this uh, in this profession, and and translation service provision competence is becoming an area of, of interest for for several training institutes. It's becoming area for of interest also for several institutions. Uh, where you are looking for more and more complex profiles of translators. So I believe these two areas are uh, going to be talked about uh, quite a lot uh, in, in a year or two or next few years. Uh, but I still believe we cannot forget even about the very traditional ones because uh, sometimes we can have a feeling that we are distancing from the very basis. Uh, but really, for me and from what I have observed mainly in the international context and institutions, the focus okay. is moving towards provision. Uh, I would like to thank you very much, Emilia, but we ran out of time. So Absolutely. I would like to thank you all. I will try to solve some questions to answer. So I would like to announce that this is the end of the session. Thank you all for attending and we go for a 10 minutes technical break. Thank you all very much. <laughs>